Some of you may remember these very frightening words. Houston, we have a problem. The technology that took them to the moon and brought them back safely and gave them that one more amp of power that they needed is the key technology, the one solution we're going to talk about today related to energy, the environment, and our economy. They all work together. As we all know, the balance of nature is at risk right now, and it's threatening our lives and the life of the planet. We're going to talk about key problems and key solutions in these areas, and it's two areas that we need to solve. How much energy we use and the kind of energy we use. Now, some of these problems we know the solutions to. Some of these problems you may not know. First of all, a problem is today they're not in balance. We can't sacrifice the environment for energy or the economy for solving the environment. They need to be in equilibrium. We know the data. This is 2,000 years of CO2. It's gone through the roof since industrialization and population growth. The last 100 years or so, fossil fuels grew, and at the same time, we got hot. EPA data shows of our global CO2, over half of it comes from fossil fuels. And it's in three areas that they're used. It's combustion for fossil fuels. It's in energy, generating electricity. It's industrial equipment, and it's transit. The key solution we're going to talk about can solve all three of these. This is a problem you may not be aware of. I call it the elephant in the room that many people don't see globally. Mechanical controls on those equipment, on transportation, on industrial equipment, on energy, on engines for generating power, most of that equipment is still based on 100-year-old process controls for motion and flow. They're big, they're slow, they're not very flexible. Keeps the environment out of balance, right? So we need to find practical solutions. This is what we say, it, they need to make sense. They need to be simple. Solutions need to be very efficient, only do what's needed, do what's safe, and at the end, it has to be economical as well. The space program is a great example of success. They had a vision, they had a mission, and the engineers figured out how to solve the problems. The key thing that happened there, the key answer going forward, is the conversion to digital. They used communications, they used computing in the space program, and it was the roots of it. It was also the roots of motion and flow control, what we call the digital valve. And the Space Foundation recognized that technology helped save Apollo 13 because it was so efficient. They had the one more amp. Also, they recognized the use on engines to benefit planet Earth and that it could be applied to all equipment around the world, all equipment that has motion and flow. So what is the digital valve? What, is, what does it mean to go digital? It means that you don't use energy to hold in a zero or one state. And if it's process control, if it's a valve, you, you use energy to change states, but you don't use energy to hold in a state. It means, like in electronics, smaller, smarter, less expensive, and much better functionality. That transition is what we need today to solve our problems. Some examples of what it can do, irrigation it's been applied to. This shows a thousand times better. It's actually, Eddie says, maybe 10,000 times less energy when you go digital. It can irrigate a whole field with a nine volt battery. Imagine that. A pick and place machine was put into production. It increased the throughput 300%, three times. Imagine if we did this all over the world, if industry started adopting this, how much less energy we would use. So now, Eddie's going to tell us about engines. Oh, I need to hand him our make-believe magnets.
<laughs> Just pretend that these are magnets. One side is the north pole, the other one is south. So if we've got opposite polarity, what are they going to do? And if they've got the same polarity, what are they going to do? They're saying repel. So, it's wrong. <laughs> it's amazing, everything that everybody learns, I learn, you learn, it's wrong. Why? Because there's no such thing as repelling forces in magnetism. <coughs> there's only forces of attraction. If you think about playing with magnets, you know that if you have opposite polarities, they're going to attract. That is right. But what happens when you flip one to the other side and you get them closer? It's not going to go away. You know that the magnet is going to flip because the force of attraction did not go away. The key point is that we don't see magnetic lines. That's why we believe this nonsense. But when everybody believes in something, people are afraid to ask why. So, okay, starting that magnetics has been misunderstood in the space program, I realized that. And I rewrote all the equations for magnetics. And I got tremendous improvements by not assuming something that's not true. So we applied this to everything we do. And that was 50 years ago. So what we need to do is question everything and then judge, but be open-minded. So now I'm gonna go to Angels. I feel like the nurse in the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody knows what this thing is? Anybody? Camshaft. That's right. It's a camshaft. It's the part of conventional engines that does the controls. But it's mechanical, so it can never change. That's the big problem. We need flexibility and way of using intelligence. So we don't do things that don't make sense. <coughs> How do we fix what's wrong? We have a very simple digital engine. If you don't do it, if you drove an internal combustion car, which probably almost all of you did, what they've done is controlling by adding more and more and more devices to be able to meet the emissions requirements. So things got more and more complicated and of course more expensive. But when you got a brains or you don't have a brains, it's a whole brand new ball game. We need to have intelligence for us to survive now, not keep using a hundred year old technology this is not just an idea that we have. That's a reality, it's happening. There are enough people that believe in what we're doing that we're able to prove in real life that chem less, that's no chem, is practical. The truck that you see has more than 15 million digital valves in it, not in one. There have been that many trucks on the road starting in 2002. So we proved that it's possible to do what we're doing. Now, in this picture, on the right-hand low corner, you see an electric car. People think that electricity is the answer. It's not. It is terrible. <laughs> Why? Because it's not zero emission because it doesn't have a tailpipe. We call it emissions someplace else. <laughs> Where is it someplace else? In Colorado Springs, this car 
was about five blocks away from the electrical generation station. The emission is in the station, not in the car. We need to realize it. We need to ask the question, where is the electricity coming from? If we look at what the car is really like, it's full of batteries, and batteries are a problem. They don't store very much energy in comparison to fuel. They've got other problems. They're not safe, and they're very heavy, so the car doesn't go very far. It's totally wrong in so many ways. Now that's showing what's happening when electricity is being generated. It's a long chain of events. Each one has inefficiencies. And I won't get into it, but the thing that I do want to get into that is really scaring me to death, and I hope it's not literal, is the transmission of electricity goes through these wires. And there is a lot of information. Carol, can you show the book? A lot of evidence that it's creating electromagnetic field. An electromagnetic field is related to diseases, including cancer. So what we need to do is not keep electrifying ourselves. It's doing the opposite, de-electrifying ourselves. There's been a lot of information about diesel engines in the news right now. We think with this solution that the whole world can adopt and industry can adopt, it can solve the problem. We don't necessarily need to have after treatment or not very much after treatment. The engines can be clean and green. And what this technology also opens the door for is being able to use biofuels. Rudolf Diesel's patent said the engine was supposed to run on biofuel. And there's all sorts of biofuels that can be used. And a smart engine can use any of them and optimize them for any condition, for whatever fuel it sees. It's, it's like a fireplace. You can put anything in it, except it can optimize it. So we say the solution needs to be, first of all, not Ma Bell. It's this model, the cell phone. Go to small distributed energy, smart, efficient engines, one at a time. You could have 100 or 1,000 like digital does. You can have wind and solar. It can complement wind and solar. And what you may not know is wind and solar can take water and turn it into a carbon-free fuel, a safe form of hydrogen in a liquid. It's completely carbon-free. So this combination that we've talked about, the technology and distributed energy and efficient engines, is the key solution. It started in the space program, and now it needs to go worldwide in industries. And it, the efficient equipment, the natural solutions, we now can have a balanced economy it can be practical. It's a practical, affordable solution that can save us and life on the planet. We hope that this will go viral. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.